Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, March 1st, and this is the time and place for the first meeting of Nevada Gaming Control Board's eSports Tactical or Technical Advisory Committee. Mr. Morton, has our agenda been posted in accordance with the open meeting law? Yes, it has. Today we'll be covering all items noted on our agenda. Mr. Morton, let's proceed with public comments. This item is placed on the agenda to give the public an opportunity to comment on matters related to esports and gaming. Anyone wishing to make a public comment, please step forward to the podium. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to offer public comment? Is there anyone in Las Vegas wishing to offer public comment? That will close our public comment section. I believe that brings us to our discussion items on the agenda. Mr. Morton, please read in the agenda item number two. Agenda item number two are opening remarks by the chair and members of the Esports Technical Advisory. I'll go first. My name is Paul Hamilton. And a little background, I am the president and CEO of the Greenspun Corporation. I'm also the president and CEO of Atlanta Esports Ventures. A partnership between Cox and Province, and we field two teams in Call of Duty League and Overwatch League. Uh, we also make investments in and around the ecosystem of esports, and I'm very excited to sit on this board. Hi, everyone. I'm Che Chow, uh, Senior Director of Esports for Ubisoft Entertainment. Uh, we're a game publisher where, uh, and we have 40 studios around the world. Um, our eSport that we participated in is called Rainbow Six Siege. Um, we actually have a league right here operating in Las Vegas. Um, I oversee league operations and strategy for our worldwide uh, leagues. So that is in North America, Latin America, Asia, and Europe. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, excited to work with all of my peers. Hello, uh, my name is Judd Hannigan. I'm the CEO of Allied Esports. Uh, Allied Esports is a uh, leader in uh, infrastructure when it comes to um, hosting tournaments and, and uh, creating content in this space. Uh, and, um, you know, we are the uh, uh, folks that created the uh, HyperX Arena down in, at the Luxor here in Las Vegas. Uh, we also have a network of infrastructure around the world, including mobile units, trucks that, uh, that, that, that travel around and host tournaments on them in North America and Europe. And we have studios in, uh, in um, uh, Germany as well, plus another facility in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, that's it on us. Looking forward to working with everybody here. Good afternoon, I'm Brett Abarbanel. I'm the Director of Research at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas International Gaming Institute. I'm also an Assistant Professor in the William F. Hara College of Hospitality at UNLV and Affiliate Researcher at the University of Sydney in Australia. I'm a co-founding director of the Nevada Esports Alliance. I've been studying the gambling uh, space within video games and esports for about the past 15 years. And I'm very proud to say that I finally just hit platinum in the latest TFT release. Christian Bishop, I'm the director of Twitch Properties. Uh, Twitch is a premier broadcasting platform for esports and video game content um, owned by Amazon. Um, prior to this, I was commissioner of an esports league called the WSOE. We operated our studio at the Aria, at the Poker Go studio. Um, and now I'm here, glad to be here with you guys. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Seth Shore. I'm the CEO of Fifth Street Gaming. Uh, very excited to be here today. I've uh, been at that podium many times over the past 15 years, never been over here. It's going to be a lot less intimidating, I'll tell you. Um, I got uh, introduced to esports back in 2015, uh, specifically with the objective of integrating esports into our casino resort experience. Uh, worked very closely with many uh, members of the Gaming Control Board and staff. Uh, to integrate uh, casino cash esport tournaments uh, at our casino in downtown Las Vegas uh, and worked hand in hand uh, with our sports book uh, partner, William Hill, to um, get the first uh, esport wagers uh, approved back in 2016. Very excited to be here today. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, board. Uh, we also have Lovell by Zoom. 
Love hey, every, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm in New York. Apologies, I couldn't make it in today. Uh, my name is Lavelle Walker. I am the VP of Business Development at Penn National Gaming. Um, my background is all Vegas based. I'm born and raised in the city. Uh, I've only been in New York now for two years. So the first 32 years of my life has been spent in Nevada, um, mostly around all things gaming, uh, slots, tables, digital on the sports betting front. But a lot of it was also spent on esports and esports initiatives, whether it was on the sports betting front or bringing events to the city. So I've spent a lot of time with a lot of the members of the committee and just looking forward to working on this initiative together. Thank you, Lovell. Mr. Morton, please read in agenda item three. Agenda item number three is a presentation by the Esports Integrity Commission on current issues related to integrity in esports events and competitions. Welcome. Please state your name for the record. I know. Yep, we hear you. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Hi. Um, I'm Ian Smith, for those of you who don't know me. Fortunately, I do know most of you on the panel. Um, Jay, I haven't seen you for quite some time, but nice to have you, <laughs> to see you again. Uh, and um, Paul, I, I think you, I don't recall that you and I have met, but um, I, I hope we will soon when the world returns to something akin to normal. Um, I wanted to make a, a quick presentation and I'm going to, to see how I'm going to be able to do that. Michael, you might be able to help me. Um, let me see. Not that. My just PowerPoint, I'm just... Yeah, you should be able to share. Oh, share screen. screen. Share screen. Got I got it. That's cool. Um, check that. Those would be super helpful if I actually had it up. Can everyone see that? Mr. Smith, we can't. There should be a okay. green button. Sorry, green button give me one second. Green. I think I know what the problem is. Zoom back up. Share. Okay. How about that? Yes, we can. Fantastic. I'll just go back to the beginning and create a slideshow here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm going to skip over this. Um, I'm the commissioner of the Esports Integrity Commission. Um, until recently, I was also the head of integrity for the PGA European Tour Golf here. Um, just recruited a replacement for me in that role because my esports role takes up um, more time uh, than I'm able to devote to any of my other roles. I'm a lawyer by uh, profession by training, although I've been in, out of private practice for 17 years now, having worked almost exclusively in sport, uh, traditional sports for that time, um, first in private practice, but then as legal director of the Professional Cricketers Association uh, in the UK, and then as the chief operating officer of the Federation of International Cricketers Associations, um, which was basically the test playing nations of, uh, of cricket throughout the world, the old Commonwealth, where I represented primarily the players. And that's where I gathered um, my unfortunate expertise in uh, 
integrity related matters and in particular match fixing and betting fraud. Um, I was also a member of the Athletes Committee of UK Anti-Doping for five years. I deal with these issues for a number of other clients in and out of sport as a consultant, and I have a security background for uh, large, um, large open traditional sports events, as you can see there. Now, in 2015, um, many of you will be well aware of this, so I'm going to canter through it, but please feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any point. Um, my introduction to esports was, despite being a gamer for more or less all my life, um, probably longer than most of you have been alive, but I was playing arcade games in the 70s when uh, Pac-Man and Xevious and games of that nature were out, but I was not a competitive gamer, um, despite um, having probably every console since the Atari. I, uh, I stuck to... I stuck to um, individual play because I'm too old and slow for, for the stuff that we're talking about today. So when I was asked to look at um, esports by the Modern Times group in Scandinavia in 2015, I actually didn't really have any idea what they were talking about. My only knowledge was around sports simulator games like FIFA um, and, and that sort of nature of game. And so when I was introduced to games like Counter-Strike, Global Offensive, uh, Defense of the Ancients to uh, League of Legends, and so on. I was not familiar with the ecosystem that had developed around that. Fortunately, I was given time to look at the industry itself and to bring my expertise from traditional sports and sports betting to that. And I found these four main integrity threats that are listed there. The cheating to win, as you can see, three of these are about winning, about gaining an unfair advantage over your opponent uh, using software hacks, aimbots, wall hacks, this kind of thing, DDoS attacks, online attacks to slow or disable an opponent. And a subset of that is the uh, doping um, to, again, to try and win. But it was really match fixing and um, cheating to lose. That, that was the main focus of my of what I found, because in those days, of course, it was very heavily linked to skins betting. I don't intend talking about that. Most of you on the panel are very familiar with skins betting. And the transition from skins betting to cash betting over the course of 2016-17, after Valve um, sent cease and desist letters to most of the sports, the esports betting sites that were using skins as currency. Um, and so we saw a huge decline in sports betting, esports betting on those sites, uh, and, 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 and then an increase in cash betting as those bettors groomed by the whole skins betting scene, primarily in Counter-Strike and Dota 2, moved to cash betting. Um, and the match fixing that had begun in those markets at a low level, opportunistic level, continued and grew as cash markets uh, grew. And so at the end of 2015, if you went online and looked for operators offering esports markets, you could find three uh, in those days, and now you will find um, well over 300. And that takes no account of those that are operating in gray and black markets on the dark web or by mobile phone or agency operations. And so there's been pretty much exponential growth in uh, esports betting ever since uh, 2017 in particular, where, where there was a dip in overall handle because of the clampdown on skins betting. But since then, it's been pretty ruthless growth. And the issue here really is that cheating to win was relatively well dealt with by the publishers who control most of uh, what goes on in esports alongside the tournament organizers. Um, because cheating to win using hacks and software poses an existential threat to the game, and therefore the publishers take it very, very seriously because the last thing on earth they want to do is lose um, casual players for who, you know, from whom they rely on for their primary uh, cash flow and income. And then um, at that time, match fixing was very poorly understood. I mean, there were a few cases in Counter-Strike 
that are very well known. I by power was one, and epsilon. But the actual mechanics of it were very poorly understood by those that controlled the industry at that time, being tournament operator uh, organizers like ESL and DreamHack and, and those who, that, that were doing well in 2015, alongside Riot as the publisher who was responsible for League of Legends esports, where there was in fact very little match fixing and only a relatively small amount of market. So this is a truism that I took through from traditional sport when I started this role, is that where there is a market, there are always people trying to manipulate it. So the only question is whether they're succeeding. And match fixing is driven by betting across all sports. And of course, esports is no exception. Now these figures, um, this is a distinction that I use just to explain this concept, it's not a term of art, although I'm trying to create one out of it. Um, this distinction between the visible and invisible markets. And again, most of you there will understand this very, very easily. The visible markets being those that you can find if you're looking to place a bet and you know what you're doing on the internet. If you want to bet on esports these days, as I say, if you know what you're doing online, you're going to find 350 odd bookmakers. Um, that, that you and if you can open an account and place a bet, um, you you can you can do that. Now that makes no comment at all on whether these are licensed, unlicensed, regulated, unregulated, legal, illegal. I don't use those distinctions because, of course, those differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And in the global world of esports, that's a largely meaningless distinction because it's a global enterprise with betters, uh, players, teams tournaments um, from all over the world. Um, so regulating them as the GCB does is relevant, of course, to what happens in Nevada, um, but not particularly relevant to something that's happening, for example, in the UK or, the, or Eastern Europe or, or in China. And that's where the red column, the invisible market comes in, because just like traditional sports, there is this invisible market that you can't just go and find uh, by by doing a Google search, you have to be uh, you have to know a guy who knows a guy, putting it bluntly, and you need to be able to know where these are found on the dark web or through mobile operations or agency operations. And just like traditional sports, the invisible market outperforms in terms of handle the visible markets by ten to fifteen times. And so, what we're talking about here. Um, was the old assessment based on some projections that um, Ehlers and Krejcik made at the time. The dip in 2017 was because of the clampdown on skins markets, where in that year we were expecting about $7.2 billion worth of handle in skins. And in fact, it was, it was only around $1.2 billion. Uh, so it, there was a big hit in that year, but then, of course, it's been uh, a meteoric rise since then. And in fact, the figures for 2020 are probably inaccurate because we saw, due to the pandemic, a gigantic increase in uh, um, in betting on esports. Because for many months we were, as an industry, the only show in town, as I'm sure your sports books uh, in Las Vegas and the rest of Nevada are well aware. So we have a, per a perfect participant demographic for gambling corruption being young men with disposable income and time on their hands. And we also uh, coordinate the, the popularity of esports in the three regions that are the biggest illegal gambling epicenters. And you'll see there that I include the USA, and that's because the rollout of legal esports betting has been slow and hampered by regulation throughout. Um, and so the many millions of existing esports bettors in the United States are still 99.9% .9 illegal uh, felons because they're not using uh, licensed betting operators to place their bets. So clearly, there is still a lot of scope for, for bad behavior. And as an industry, esports is highly vulnerable. So historically, we dealt or we detected match fixing by whistleblowers, um, decent journalism, the odd law enforcement uh, operation, 
but it was entirely haphazard. And of course, we were only seeing a very, very small amount of what was actually going on. And so nowadays, uh, as with traditional sport, the primary method for determining whether a match might be fixed um, is to monitor the betting. And so that's what we've done um, over the years. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. But to back that up, within the tournament system, you need to have proper regulations and procedures. Um, so you know, a good anti-corruption code, for example, or, or some form of rules that, that deal with the, the issue of betting on, the, on uh, esports. You need investigative capacity, of course, which uh, the enforcement division at the GCB, of course, has. But also you need that on an international scale because this is an international global problem. Those regulations need to give you the uh, a decent basis for the prosecution of bad actors. We also, of course, need some form of deterrence and uh, engagement with the sports betting industry, because if you don't engage with that industry, how on earth are you going to get the information necessary to, to point you in the direction of where fixing might occur? So the way in which this works from an ESIC perspective is that we have created our suspicious bet alert network, which includes, uh, of course, the board itself, but data companies like Grid and Bayes and Sport Radar um, and uh, Odin and various uh, B2B uh, esports data companies that deal with um, live real-time data and convert that into markets and media. We deal with many uh, operators ranging from online only esports only operators through to large non-endemic sports books like betway and uh, the gbc uh, sorry the entain brands like um, ladbrooks and coral and so on and then monitoring companies like the international betting integrity association um, the global lotteries monitoring service and finally um, both law enforcement and regulators like the United Kingdom Gambling Commission, the Maltese Gaming Authority, the Isle of Man, uh, New Jersey DGE, and so on. And any one of those uh, members of our Suspicious Better Learn network um, with whom we have individual um, information exchange M uh, MOUs feeds into the center uh, an alert of whatever they're seeing. We, we then feed that out to the rest of the group and receive responses to that alert on the base, you know, on whatever the operator slash data company monitoring service law enforcement regulator are seeing in their own markets. And that helps us determine what we ought to be investigating on behalf of our esports tournament operator members and um, also helps the betting operators and various companies understand what's going on in the market, how to best protect themselves, what integrity threats there may be to their businesses. Um, and so it's, it's a pretty virtuous circle um, and works very, very well. And it's ever expanding. We're constantly signing new operators and new companies into that um, network to try and ensure as universal a cover as we possibly can uh, around what's going on in esports betting markets. Um, to give you some idea of where we are uh, in terms of the stats, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, well over 70% of all markets globally are on Counter-Strike Global Offensive and Dota 2. They are by far the biggest um, games in the betting world, primarily because of skins betting. Uh, you know, th those Valve products uh, as owners of both games, particularly in skins, basically, putting it bluntly, groomed a generation of bettors. And that has continued into cash betting so that uh, Counter-Strike in particular accounts for well over 40% of global handle on esports betting and Dota 2 at a, uh, somewhere well into the 20% somewhere. And then you have League of Legends, which sort of fluctuates between 11 and 13% of the market, and then the rest, right? Uh, and so in terms of the alerts that we had in 20 you could see about a 275% increase due to the pandemic in suspicious bet alerts uh, in 2020. And that trend has continued unabated into 2021 and so far in the early 
parts of 2022. And putting it bluntly, we've been overwhelmed by that. I was coping with the investigatory load up until the, the, the sort of middle of 2020, but then the pandemic threw us all such a gigantic curveball that we're only now catching up with the recruitment of a full-time investigations uh, manager because I, I cannot cope with the volume of uh, suspicious bet alerts and potential match fixing. And so we're, we've, the recruitment process ends, I think, in a week's time, I think. And we hope to have that person on board by the end of the month or early April to take on that workload because we have a gigantic investigatory workload to, to work through. We also do a lot of education work for participants. I see this as the most effective deterrent to uh, bad behavior within esports. And that's been very, very successful uh, over the years at live events. Of course, over the last two years, I've been having to do this by Zoom um, with referees, admins, players, teams, and so on. It's a fairly constant part of my work and other members of our team. But that, that we are going back to an online system. Uh, this system that's explained in this slide has um, unfortunately crashed due to uh, old software that we can't repair and can't do anything about. So we're in the process of uh, totally redoing the education process. But what this basically allows is anybody anywhere in the world to log on and get a basic level of anti-corruption education. And we do a bunch of other things that I'm not going to spend a great deal of time talking about. Um, but one of those elements is, you'll see towards the bottom there, the lobbying for legislative regulation of gambling, because as I'm sure many of you will be aware, is outside of jurisdictions like Nevada um, and a few European jurisdictions and, and say Australia, the regulation of sports betting worldwide is shockingly bad. Um, and even where there is reasonable legislation uh, or regulation, there is very little enforcement. And so in many, many countries, and China being the one that's that really stands out here. The regulation uh, is, is primarily prohibition. That, that's the regulation, the prohibition. The problem is that it is not enforced in any meaningful way. And then the Chinese government has a sum total of seven people dedicated to the uh, detection and enforcement of, of their prohibition on sports betting. And you can imagine how uh, effective that is, particularly in a population that is the second highest per capita spenders on gambling in the world uh, after Australia. So a lot of our problems emanate from China and Eastern Europe. Uh, and if we could eliminate match fixing in China and or, or sorry, the attempt of match fixing and betting fraud from Chinese and Russian bettors, we would probably eliminate 85 to 90 percent of corrupt betting worldwide, at least match fixing. Um, so that's quite an important priority to get intelligence from that area. But most of you know what we are and what we do. We're a not-for-profit members association. Our primary focus is match fixing and betting fraud in esports. And we are trying to bring together as many people within the esports ecosystem into that form of standard regulation to create some consistency across the various games. Uh, as well as the levels of competition. Because of course, as betting grows, as more markets are offered, the lower down the ecosystem these markets are offered to more and more and more small events where, and, and this is something for the, obviously for the committee to consider as you look at how you open up esports wagering, is that of course I expect um, Nevada, as it already has, to start with these high-level events. But once you create markets, the hunger for them will undoubtedly put pressure uh, on um, the, the operators and the markets to start offering more and more and more. And in order to do that, you're going to have to go lower and lower down the ecosystem. And of course, that's where the real problems arise. If you're offering markets on the League of Legends World Championship, you're pretty safe from uh, any betting fraud and 
particularly match fixing. But if you're starting to offer markets on some third tier Dota event that's currently being held online by a tournament operator based in Belarus, uh, you're going to have problems uh, for sure. Dota 2 is by far the most corrupt game uh, in, in esports because it's very, very popular in Eastern Europe and uh, in China. But we can talk more about that as and when you need to. But uh, this is what ESIC is. And, our, and the, the mainstay of this for us is the anti-corruption code, which is mandatory for all of our members to enact within their terms and conditions of participation. So our tournament organizer members um, from the biggest in the world like ESL down to small tournament operators, which are basically two guys with a laptop running small Dota or, or Counter-Strike tournaments, uh, have to include our jurisdiction through the anti-corruption code into their events so that we can uh, do something about it if we detect match fixing. We can investigate and prosecute where prosecution is justified by the evidence based on the betting and the match and linking the players to the betters. So you can see very typical um, anti-corruption offenses on the list of offenses within the code there. Match fixing, obviously, betting on your own game. If you're a, you know, I see uh, Chase there, if you're a Rainbow Six professional, you cannot bet on Rainbow Six. Uh, that, that's a basic rule. Um, and similarly, the only complex rule there sometimes because nuance is difficult is the misuse of inside information. And so a lot of our education is around making players aware of what inside information is and why it's dangerous to uh, allow that outside of the tent of your particular team or, or group. Um, we have a positive obligation on players subject to our code to report corrupt or, uh, approaches or acts uh, and a positive obligation to cooperate with our investigations and prosecutions, including giving of witness statements and so on. And you can see there are serious consequences to breach. Anybody who has followed our work over the past five years has banned quite a significant number of players for betting and, and match-fixing offences, as well as cheating. We've had no breaches of our anti-doping code, fortunately. No player has yet been banned in esports for a doping offence, but that's probably because we can only test at LAN events. It's too expensive to do out-of-competition testing. Um, nobody's prepared to pay for that. And so when we test it primarily at large Counter-Strike, Dota, or League of Legends events, and um, so far we've had no positive tests. Uh, we've had a few recreational problems with things like ecstasy, um, and we don't test for marijuana for fairly obvious reasons, I think. But if anyone wanted to talk about that, they can. So it's a canter because I thought it was more important, given that most of you know us and know our work, and know me to see if there were any questions or anything else I could help you with. Paul Hamilton, for the record. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ian. I thought that was really well done. I live with a lot of the stuff that you're talking about right now. We're in both in both leagues that we're in. We're, we're like actively figuring out a lot of the, you know, the doping stuff is obviously really difficult because we are online matches right now. Right. Cheating at a live event is really, really difficult just if you're on a closed network, which is what they're doing. Um, and it's interesting what a lot of people may not know, but the way that cheaters are usually caught is by other pros because there's just mechanics and movement that people can and can't make. And those are usually the guys that look up and say, uh, this guy's for sure cheating. And so, it was it was very insightful. Does anyone on the board have a question or a comment? Ian, as always, a pleasure. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm sorry that we can't do this in person right now. Me too. Uh, just uh, just a, a couple questions for you. Um, Hello, can you please state your name? This is the court reporter. Okay. With Please apologies. This is Brett Abarbanel for the record. Thank you. I remembered to turn on the mic, but not say my own name. 
Uh, so, Ian, with the bet alert network that you have, do you have any skins betting entities that are part of this network? Uh, we'll start with that. <laughs> Um, no, we no longer do, Brett. What we found mm -hmm. is that uh, more or less all of them have dropped esports uh, e betting from their offerings. So there's still a ton of gambling. Um, they're still offering all the usual, you know, two flies crawling up a window pane type stuff. Um, but no, the esports e betting has dropped up to negligible levels on skin sites now. And so it doesn't really affect our work any longer. Well, my follow-up to that was going to be, would it be beneficial for a network like that to have such entities? But it sounds like it would not be at this point in the trajectory of, of skins wagering. Yeah, no, it, it, it's largely it's largely pointless these days. It, it has very little impact on the match fixing uh, situation. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Ian. And then uh, one other question, uh, having now covered currency types, though, uh, geographically, uh, it sounds like from your presentation and, and separately, you and I have talked about this in the past however many years now, um, with Southeast Asia, China, and, and the US and Eastern Europe as well, uh, being some of these hubs for mentioned match fixing as well as other corruption issues. Uh, do you feel like your network covers those geographical areas well? Is that something that you're looking to expand into uh, for the purposes of this committee, if we're gonna be making recommendations one way or the other, that might be something that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I'd like to say two things about it. The first is that the current somewhat clunky email system that we use is about to be replaced by what's called the EIMS, which is a real-time web-based system, uh, eSports integrity monitoring system that we're currently running a beta with a few of our uh, a few of our betting members trying to iron out the bugs and security issues. So it becomes a more effective system. But you're right, you know, I we get some intelligence. And this works at two levels. So firstly, the, the principal source of betting in China, at least for the average punter, is uh, market or rather operator skins um, run out of the Philippines, primarily out of Manila and then some out of, out of Taiwan. And we do have quite a few members uh, from there. So we are getting some intelligence, but broadly speaking, this is a market that's almost in it's very opaque, it's very hard to see into. And so the vast majority of my intelligence actually comes um, via uh, reporting lines that I've set up on Discord groups for bet for bet tours who are noticing discrepancies in markets that we can't see. Um, and it's a very imperfect system, but we haven't really found another way of penetrating successfully into that. Now that's China in, in terms of mainland China. Eastern Europe is actually really easy to see into because these guys bet in, in uh, legal markets or at least visible markets just using proxies and VPNs. That, that is far less sophisticated, um, but uh, just, just as corrupt. And then finally, America is, um, again, we, we know which operators are offering markets in, in, um, in the US, largely speaking. And so work with the FBI has been reasonably helpful for us there in pointing us at the right names. The problem I find with that is that these are primarily Bitcoin sites. Um, and again, very, very hard to very, very hard to, to follow these markets because these guys have clients all over the world. So it's very, very hard to tell where the bets are coming from. So we can see problems in the markets, but we don't it's often really hard to tell where they're arising. Thank you. It's, it's really interesting to see how Nevada plugs into this global setting. So thank you, Ian. Uh, Lavelle Walker for Paul the Paul Hamilton for the, oh, go ahead, Lavelle. Oh, sorry, Paul, I can't, I can't see you. I apologize for stepping on you there. No, no, you're uh, good, you're up. Ian, just a little bit more of a question to, to counter what Brett was asking. When it comes to the United States, you mentioned League of Legends is, especially the finals, is something that's safe when it comes to an operator offering that to, the, to their 
to their punters. And I use punters since you use that term. Um, what other leagues or how many of those leagues exist that you feel are on that quote unquote safe list where you don't have to worry about the threats that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, um, so so basically the top end um, Counter-Strike leagues, and, and, and I'm only saying partly this is because these are already ESIC members, so Blast Premier, um, ESL Pro League, the, these sort of things. Um, I have, and Paul, you'll forgive me for this, some trepidation around Blizzard Activision's um, attitude towards betting uh, with respect to both the Overwatch League and, um, and the Call of Duty League. Uh, I both from a I don't have enough information point of view and Blizzard Activision have always been incredibly uh, uncooperative. I mean, I, I've been talking to them since 2015 and uh, since Nate Nanza left to go to Epic some years ago when he was commissioner of the Overwatch League, I've lost everyone I knew there has gone. Uh, so I'm just speaking openly and bluntly about this because I Initially, the setup was definitely safe with the Overwatch League. Yeah, I've, I've no doubt about what the intention was, but I've been unable to get any information about what is actually happening. So I can't, um, I, I can't give them a, a, not that I'm saying that they're unsafe, I'm just not able to say that they are safe. Um, but, the, but Riot run competitions in League of Legends and Valorant are really well done. I've got absolutely... Um, I, I work very closely on the Valorant side, and I have examined League of Legends. It's as soon as it drops down to those regional competitions that are not directly run by Riot, that are uh, effectively outsourced to small, smaller tournament operators, um, where literally the only problems we've ever had in, in League of Legends have been at that level. Um, I, 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 I think Riot has done an excellent job. Um, in, in creating a safe environment for their, their in-house run tournament. Um, and, and then just, oh, sorry, I should, I should also mention that although we've never done anything formal and this would precede your time at Ubisoft, Che, um, I've always had a, a, a close contact with Virginie and, and the people on, on the Rainbow Six side of things um, because historically those events were until relatively recently run by ESL, uh, who were a member. So I was on top of what was going on in Rainbow Six, um, you know, and, and was perfectly happy with it uh, historically. And, and it, it doesn't generate massive betting markets. So it's not, it's not been a, in any way an unsafe product. We've never had uh, problems with Rainbow Six. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Paul Hamilton, for the record. Ian, no worries on Overwatch and COD. They are very, very tight-lipped, and um, <laughs> that, you don't need to apologize for that. Um, on the, there, were, there was a, early on in your presentation, there was four risks, I believe, that, that you saw. Can you run them down from the top and give me a chance to comment and ask you some questions on each one? Yes, yeah, sure. The, the first and, and biggest one by far as an integrity risk is cheating to win, um, to which you've already referred to, Paul, um, which you're absolutely right. At LAN events is particularly difficult, but not impossible. The nickel comma what the um, uh, forsaken banning that we did a couple of years ago was at a LAN event um, because he brought the software in on uh, his, his SD card or Counter-Strike was actually really hard to find and the point you made is absolutely accurate every case of cheating that we've prosecuted in the last three years was not detected by anti-cheat software it was detected by opponents it was it, the guys were confronted by allegations from opponents and uh and and we got a confession and found the software in two of those cases we would not have found the software but for the player confessing and showing us where it was it's become really sophisticated at a high level. Sure, I agree. Um, the other one you brought up were, was um, just software attacks. For clarity, for those in the room and those that are unaware, uh, what happens is there when you're online, there are DDoS attacks where somebody will come in and just flood a server and make it so that one team's performance either completely fails mid-game or slows them down to the point where they can't win. Uh, one of the solutions around that, as we start to think about, you know, how we feel about 
betting and, and how we do it appropriately. One way that one of the leagues that we're affiliated with did it was they, they the game time announcement time was different than the actual show time. Show time was done in a private room where nobody knew. And to Ian's point earlier, mu much of what we have to deal with is really around the human. Um, of all the risks, um, DDoSing can be dealt with and, and doping and all these things there are pretty clear solutions that requires a lot of work together in unity but the, still the the biggest risk here is, is is the player and and the more they make the less we're at risk as you talk about league or you talk about the cdl pros when they start to make a million dollars they're less probably willing to think about throwing a match for whatever amount of money but i think that's the one that is the most difficult uh, it's the most difficult in regular sports. It's the most difficult in esports, and uh, at least in the two leagues I'm in, we spend an awful lot of time with this with the same group. That and I can't actually go too far into that, but we spend an awful lot of time with them, sort of educating them on everything from uh, you know how getting how they handle their own money and the people that will be after them and and all these things. But of of the cheap possibilities out there, the one that most concerns me is the human being actually to your point giving information out maybe saying you know something is as basic as you know we've been really bad in scrims today they practice esports the same way you practice basketball and so and so is really falling off and i don't know what's wrong and just knowing that then you may go down and make a bet so i think a lot of what this committee will have to think about is how to deal with the human element of of cheating in esports I, I agree, Paul. I mean, that's where all of our issues arise. And education is by far the at least foundational, but I think it's even more important than that because we found it has a, a good deterrent effect. If people know they're being watched, they are far less likely. And if they know how we detect uh, fraud, you know, cheating to win is difficult. I mean, obviously with doping, you, you've got to test. Um, that, that's that's the, you know, pretty much the only way and it's expensive and difficult. But it's also relatively low risk because the advantage that doping gives is, is unknown. Uh, it, it's speculative. It's anecdotal. There's no good evidence that taking Adderall helps you be a better, uh, or Ritalin helps you be a better esports player, but people believe that it does. And this is, but, but the only way you can do anything about that really is you know, education to some extent, but you've got to be testing. You have to have an anti-doping program. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're pretty much wasting your time. I think, and, and you know, running anti-cheat is, is helpful, but at the highest level, as we've said, it's, you know, the guys are sophisticated. It's not that easy. And, and I, these days, rely on pros to point out when they think someone's cheating against them. Um, and then finally, on the DDoS attacks, you're right. I mean, it's, it, it happens very, very seldom at higher levels. I mean, really, really seldom. The biggest issue for us is the temptation that players uh, can be coerced, bribed, uh, or feel um, that, they, that they can do something to their own advantage. And, and particularly with respect to match fixing, there are really two types of match fixing. There's what I call opportunistic match fixing, which is really where the players or coach or team look at a situation and decide to match fix based on something as simple as, hey, if, firstly, if we win this game, it's meaningless in terms of context. An awful lot of competitions, particularly in Dota, have no context. There's no narrative. They're just a tournament. They don't mean anything. And be, with that lack of narrative, it just becomes about the prize money. So they look at the situation and go, ah, oh, you know, if we win, we're going to get $500 each. But if we bet against ourselves and lose, we can make two grand each. Let's do that. So that's opportunistic fixing. And then you've got the more traditional sport betting fixing, which is where a betting syndicate or, bat or better um, will effectively coerce in some way, bribe, uh, otherwise persuade a player, for, usually for a fee, but sometimes it's something else. Um, to to um, throw the match, so you know I'll give you five grand if you if you throw match two in a best of three. So so that's what we're looking for is how to how to plug, detect it, plug those vulnerabilities, 
and 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 I think we're reasonably effective with that. But there's a long way to go in terms of getting an accurate picture of what's going on in the markets, because that's the only way we're going to find out if a match is well. Not the only way, but by far the most effective way of finding out whether a match is potentially fixed or not. Agreed. Thank you, Ian. I think there are still a couple of questions. Hi, Che Chow, for the record. Hi, Ian. Um, you've talked about match fixing and the importance of detecting it. Um, the obviously with the human elements, um, you know, I think that is a, a lot more ambiguous. But with um, betting match fixing, um, you've talked about partners like Sports Radar, Bayes, um, who I assume detect match fixing through data anomalies. Um, can you elaborate on what is ESIC's relationship with these companies? How do you work with them? How do they provide you this data? What is the process that you have? Um, and on the whole, how does it, how does Counter Strike and ESIC and these companies, how, how does it all fit together? Can you help sure. educate the panel, please? Yeah, sure. So, with, with each of these companies that have some form of involvement with esports live data and or betting, um, so Bayes being um, uh, partly owned by Sport Radar would typically go and buy the rights to the live data from a tournament organ. Um, and what they do is package those, create markets, and sell them on to betting operators and media. Now, they, of course, monitor the performance of those markets because generally their arrangement is a profit share with the uh, or some kind of fee with the betting operator. So it's in their interest to make sure that those are accurate and helpful and profitable markets. And so any one of the members of the sports betting uh, alert network has an individual memorandum of understanding with us for the sharing of data. It's, so basically, we look at the data protection laws um, throughout the world, and in particular with Europe with the GDPR, and we we create a contractual basis for sharing of information, which is backed up by the general provision or exemption around the um, identification and, and investigation of criminal activity, which in most of Europe, uh, match fixing in one way or another or betting fraud is a criminal activity. So we can exchange data on that basis with law enforcement, with regulators, with data companies. And so anyone can spot an anomaly um, in, in terms of where they are in that ecosystem. The, op the betting operators are the, the most obvious because they have internal integrity systems that are linked to us. So what they'd list, they, they'll have a, a compliance or integrity guy who their automated systems will, will pop up an alert. The human will then look at that, uh, at that particular alert and determine whether or not this is something to worry about. And his first priority, of course, as an employee of that operator is to protect the operator's position. So he makes a decision about voiding markets, limiting bets, shutting off a particular punter or whatever. But the next thing he does, um, and, and this is strongly enforced in Nevada uh, amongst other good sports betting jurisdictions, is that he, he has an obligation to inform the regulator. So he will call enforcement or whoever and say, hey, we've got a problem uh, with this particular market, this particular bet, this punter. He will then uh, usually contact the sport uh, under an MOU or some form of legislative obligation. Uh, in Australia or the UK, there's an actual legislative obligation to, to liaise with the sport. Uh, and that's where we step in. We sit in a lot of jurisdictions, that's ESIC. So we tend to be like the third priority of the integrity guy at any particular operator or data company. Protect himself first, make sure his license, his regulator isn't annoyed and isn't, uh, he isn't breaching license conditions because the license is gold. And then where the sport is next is, okay, now we better tell ESIC or, the, you know, or FIFA or whoever's really. Um, and so we get that information at a general level that goes out to everyone in the network so we can see who else has been affected or we can get intelligence about why 
the betting is behaving in the way that it's behaving. All of this is done at a general level. When it becomes specific is that, let's say at the end of this exchange of initial information, we find that there are three bookmakers that, who are members who have, with whom we have these MOUs that have been affected. Our dealings with them then go to one-on-one -on -one because now we're operating under the MOU. So it becomes private and confidential at that point because that's when we start exchanging sensitive information around where are these bets being placed? Can we get client details? Because one of my priorities is to link the people placing the bets with the people playing the game. That, that, that's the key, right? We look at the betting data, we look at the match data. In other words, is there, is there play within the match that indicates that these players are deliberately underperforming? Are they trying to achieve a betting outcome? Um, and, and sometimes we can find that evidence and sometimes we can't. But the best thing is for us to link the betters to the players, which in esports, I have to say, has been alarmingly easy because these guys are idiots. But they are becoming more sophisticated. So the days when we could find that they went to school together or that they're married or that they're brothers or that they live next door to each other are declining because people are getting better at this, right? So, but, but that's still the case in esports a lot with opportunistic fixing. You find it's the brother that placed the bet. So that's how basically the, the network works. So we... We liaise very closely with an individual operator that has been affected by the fraud that we think has taken place. Does that answer your question, Che? It does, thank you. Uh, this is Judd Hannigan, for the record. Uh, Ian, uh, it's good to speak to you. For the, also, for the record, um, Allied Esports is a member of ESIC as a tournament organizer. Uh, and have operated by E6 codes and, and uh, certainly leveraged their uh, monitoring and, and enforcement uh, with regards to our tournaments uh, is concerned. Um, I just, you know, as we as a group here uh, evaluate and explore and, and uh, the path for, um, you know, regulatory structure here uh, and how that might evolve uh, as we look at the existing structure, uh, are there areas um, uh, that you recommend we hone in on and target here, uh, specifically as it relates to cheating to win and and um, uh, and match fixing, uh, that you might uh, recommend we be looking at as we as we explore how the the current structure evolves into something that can scale. Yes, thanks, Judd. Yeah, I think look on the cheating to win side, there there is strong support for uh, the detection and prosecution of cheats at the highest level is, is, is difficult, but it's also backed up by a very strong will on the part of tournament operators, uh, organizers, and, um, uh, and uh, publishers, because they, they have a, a really direct commercial interest in detecting, prosecuting, and eliminating people who are using software to subvert their game. Um, and so it's, in terms of, how you act as a committee, bluntly again, I wouldn't put a great deal of priority on it because that job is being done for you already. You know, of course, cheating to win affects the whether or not you you offering successful markets. You know, somebody's cheating to win, it's going to distort any market as it would in any sport. But there is as much being done about that as is possible to be done. There's not, there's not a great deal that, that any additional regulation or monitoring could, could do. I think you just have to accept that as with any other sport, occasionally cheating is going to happen. And if it's detected and it distorts the markets, then operators uh, will take whatever action they would take as if it was, you know, you found out that deflate gate was real and that the New England Patriots cheated. Not that I'm saying they did. Um, but you can see how it, it's the same, right? It, I wouldn't, I would not lose sleep about cheating to win in a wagering context. I would lose sleep about uh, the possibility of match fixing. Um, but 
no more than I would if I was offering markets on uh, on football, uh, and I mean a real football, not um, Las Vegas Raiders football. Um, although I would worry about that as well, but I, I've never heard of a of a match fix in in the NFL. Um, but this is um, this is what I would do, Chad, and, and and this is something that I've I've talked to New Jersey, Ohio. Pennsylvania, various other states around is you you obviously have been put in position because there is a great deal of caution around esports betting because there's no governing body to go to. It, it, it is to some extent still a little bit wild west. It's still risky. And the caution that's been displayed by the gaming control board to date is is to some extent justified, but my view is that it's overcautious. Um, it, and whilst I completely understand that, the, the net result has been, and I'm sure Seth and you guys, most of you would agree, has been the, the outcome has been that the, the market for wagering on esports has gone nowhere uh, in, in the years since it was effectively allowed by the, by, the, by the governor's committee. And I think the only way to really address that with any uh, hope of of it being attractive to the operators and the punters is to create some kind of whitelist um, of safe events so that the operators can plan. And so that's on the one, that's about events that are happening outside of Nevada. So, so your, your typical you know, big tentpole esports event, IEM Katowice, League of Legends, World Championship, Overwatch League, Call of Duty, you know, is, is put together a high level whitelist. I think the other part of it is how do you regulate events happening in Nevada for wagering purposes? And I, I don't want to take up a lot of your time. I've got a lot of ideas around how this committee could formulate a set of standards of regulations that a um, that the tournament organizer and participants would have to abide by in order for for the gaming control board to authorize wagering on that event. I think it's simple. Um, I think it well. On the one hand, it's really simple: force them to become ESIC members. But that's a terribly self-serving thing for me to say. But I, I, I do say it um, with with you know as a genuine idea. Um, but something along those lines of creating a set of standards akin to the ESIC code, or make them members of the ESIC code, but something that at least gives you the ability to uh, be sure that the right set of standards is being um, applied for events that are, you know, in in Nevada on which you wish to offer uh, you you wish to offer wages. So the big events outside on a whitelist, the events inside uh, subject to a set of standards. Does does that make sense? Thank you, Ann. Yes, it does. If we have no more questions, thank you, Mr. Smith. We appreciate your attendance. My pleasure. And I hope that uh, the rest of the meeting goes well. Um, I'm afraid it's quite late at night here, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I'll love and leave you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Morton. Please read in agenda item four. Agenda item number four is a presentation by the Office of the Attorney General related to the current regulatory structure for wagering on esports in Nevada. Welcome. Uh, Please state your name for the record. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Hamilton, members of the committee. For the record, I am John McKellar with the Attorney General's Office, and I am also your legal counsel. As a committee, you are charged with making recommendations to the Nevada Gaming Control Board concerning how to safeguard the integrity of esports when wagers are placed on esports competitions. My slides don't seem to be advancing here. <laughs> Uh, 
Based on this charge, I am before you today to present you your starting point. That is the current state of Nevada law concerning wagering on esports and how it evolved to this point. Esports are regulated in Nevada as other events. The Nevada legislature created the other event term of art by adding it to the definition of sports pool during the 2009 legislative session. Essentially, the legislature explicitly authorized sports pools to take wagers on any event to increase casino business and state tax revenue subject to the discretion of the Nevada Gaming Commission and the Nevada Gaming Control Board. The legislature also made changes to allow wagering on other events to take place through sports wagering apps. In 2010 and 2011, the Nevada Gaming Control Board drafted and the Nevada Gaming Commission adopted amendments to Regulation 22.120. These amendments set up the regulatory structure for other events. The other events contemplated by these amendments were tournaments involving poker, i.e. the World Series of Poker, slot machines, other casino games, and billiards. Under these amendments, other events were individually approved by the board chair. In 2015, the board proposed and the commission adopted amendments to Regulation 22, which created virtual events as a subset of other events. Virtual events are things like computer-generated horse races. In 2016, the Gaming Policy Committee met several times to specifically discuss esports. In these meetings, it was publicly recognized that the board classified esports as other events. This made sense as regulating esports as other events has always been a good fit. The Gaming Policy Commission also suggested a statutory change to allow paramutual wagering on other events and esports. In 2017, the legislature authorized paramutual wagering on other events. In testimony on this bill, esports was given as an example of an other event on which paramutual wagers could be taken. After this bill was passed, Regulation 26B was updated to include other events. Regulation 26B is the paramutual sports game, sports wagering regulation. In 2019, the board proposed and the commission adopted amendments to Regulation 22, which added two fast track processes for the approval of wagering on other events. Events sanctioned by a sanctioning organization and pre-approved other events. This brings us to the current regulatory structure concerning other events, which includes esports. There are three ways for an esports event to be approved so that a sports book may take wagers on the event. One, the board chair or designee approves each esport event individually. Two, the esports event is sanctioned by a sanctioning organization on the list of sanctioning organizations. And three, the sport esports event is listed on the list of pre approved other events. Chair approved other events were the only method of approving sports pools to take wagers on esports until 2019. The regulation states that it is approval by the chair and chair is defined to be the board chair or the chair's designee. In practice, the chair's designee has been someone from the board's enforcement division, which vets the requests for approval. The requirements for chair approval are a request for approval made at least 30 days prior to an event uh, and the request has to be made by a sports a licensee with a sports pool approval. Um, and the request must include a full description of the event, the manner in which the wagers would be placed, and winning wagers determined, a full description of any technology necessary to determine the outcome of the event, integrity information, complete event rules and voting procedures, and any additional information required by the chair or designee. The required integrity information must demonstrate the event can be effectively supervised, there are safeguards in place 
explicitly to ensure the integrity of the event and the wagers thereon. The outcome of the event is verifiable. The outcome of the event is generated by a reliable and independent process. The outcome of the event would be unlikely to be affected by any wager placed and the event complies with any applicable laws. And finally, approving the event comports with Nevada public policy. The general statement of Nevada public policy is contained at NRS 463.0129 and essentially states that Nevada strictly regulates gaming for the protection of public health, safety, morals, good order, and general welfare of the inhabitants of Nevada, ensuring that gaming is conducted honestly, competitively, and free from criminal or corrupt developments. The chair or designee may approve or deny the request. In approving the request, the approval may be limited, restricted, and or conditioned. The chair may also refer the request for a decision by the full board and commission. I'm not aware of this ever happening, but if it did, it would follow the general application process, including uh, the fees for an application, uh, where the board would make a recommendation and the commission would give final approval. If a problem arises during an event, the chair or designee may issue an interlocutory order revoking or suspending the approval to take wagers on the event. If the approval of an event is denied or is revoked or suspended, such denial, revocation, or suspension may be reviewed through the administrative review process set out in Regulation 4. And when I say regulation, I'm talking about the Nevada Gaming Com Commission regulations in case that was not clear. This allows for review by the full board, and if a licensee is unhappy by the board decision, uh, further review by the commission may be had. And this full process is set out in regulations 4.185 through 4.195. Upon approval of wagering on an event, the board posts notice on its website and any book may take wagers on the event, not just the book that applied for approval. Subject, of course, to any limitations or conditions contained in the approval. Some recent esports approvals include, and I would, um, as a footnote, add to this that these were all approved when uh, athletic sports contests like the NFL and et cetera were shut down for pandemic reasons, uh, include the 2020 SL1 Dota 2 Birmingham the 2020 DreamHack Masters Spring, the 2020 ESL One Road to Rio, the ESL One Rio CSGO Major 2020, and the 2020 Call of Duty League. The chair or designee is authorized to create a list of pre-approved other events. The chair or designee may place an event on this list if an event has previously been approved. With pre-approval, a request for approval is not necessary for the books to take wagers on the pre-approved event. With regard to esports, and I understand this one might be a borderline esport, um, the list of pre-approved events presently includes the Golden Tee World Championship. Current law allows for the chair or designee to curate a list of sanctioning organizations. If a sanctioning organization is on the list of sanctioning organizations, a book may accept wagers on any event sanctioned by the sanctioning organization. For esports, this would be the equivalent of the NCAA, NFL, NBA, et cetera. To date, there are not any sanctioning organizations on this list. And I would expect this to change as the esports industry matures. In addition to the approval processes I've just discussed, which apply to the approval of wagering on esports, other integrity controls are in place, which apply to wagering on esports as well. Books are prohibited from accepting wagers from esports officials, owners, coaches, staff of a participant or team, or participants in an event in which they take place. Books are required to report suspicious transactions involving wagering on esports, and account wagering rules, such as prohibiting past post wagers 
and prohibiting out-of-state wagers also apply to esports. I I hope this brief history and synopsis of current law regarding wagering on esports is helpful to you in carrying out your charge from Senate Bill 165 to make recommendations to the board concerning the integrity of esports when wagers are placed on such competitions. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, quick question for the record, this is Jed Hannigan. Um, were there no esports events uh, in 2021 that they received uh, the status? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, I would defer to uh, Chief Taylor. He is shaking his head in the negative, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the record, this is Lavelle Walker. Uh, the process to be a pre-approved event is, Golden TSL was the only one there. Those prior events, they're not grandfathered into that status. Is there a follow-up step that needs to be taken? Uh, it, it's discretionary on the board level. Um, any event that has been previously approved can be considered um, a pre-approved event. It's up to the, the chair or designee. And I, I would defer to Chief Taylor if he wants to elaborate on that process. Thank you, James Taylor, for the record. I'm the chief of the enforcement division. It really would depend on the tournament itself. If we have a comfort level with that tournament, if they continue to, to host the same tournament with the same oversight and the same rules, it would be something that we would consider. But so far, there hasn't been much interest in, in that going forward. We haven't had any in the last, uh, what, 18 months, any tournaments at all. So hopefully with the help of this committee, we can we can increase the awareness and the and the enthusiasm for not just hosting the tournaments here in the state, but also uh, the wagering on those tournaments in the state and outside. Uh, Chief Taylor, uh, quick question: um, Are there sanctioning organizations today, as a part of the gaming board, for um, real life sports? Uh, and what, what there are regulating bodies and and uh, like the commissioner over NFL that have sanctioning bodies, if you will, the, the International Olympic Committee, we consider that a body that we, we allow uh, Olympics. Um, all, of, all of those are, in, are on the list, NFL, NBA, those, those types. Okay, so, um, so the NFL are their own sanctioning body, essentially, for the, right. okay. thank you. Oversight bodies. Christian Bishop, for the record, has, has there been an application from another esports or, or game company in the past to be sanctioned as an organization? I don't believe so. Brett Abarbanel for the record. Uh, Chief Taylor, when you say uh, that an organization would have to have the same rules each year as this event would go on, um, video games, particularly those relevant to esports, are known for regularly updating their game. Is this something that would come into play with regard to? same rules or would that be something that would, could theoretically be left out of uh, an approval for a sanctioning organization? Well, it would depend on what, how significant the rule change is. If it's something that we've been comfortable with for you know, a period of time, then we wouldn't have to revet that every time, right? And so that's why we would put that on the pre-approved list. If it is something that's going to be changing drastically every year, we would want to re revisit that every year and look at it every year. But if it was a minor change or just a rule update, I mean, even the NFL changes the rules on overtime or, or things as it goes. It's, but we would want to be comfortable with what, what they have in place today in order to make that a pre-approved for tomorrow. Paul Hamilton, for the record. Hi, Chief Taylor. Uh, thanks for helping us out here. Yeah. So just for clarity, uh, Call of Duty releases a new game every year. Is it more around the handling of the sanctioning body? It's more around this is how we're going to treat everything in and around the game as opposed to the game. The, game, the games all evolve constantly. It's really around the framework of how we handle or how the, you know, let's, let's, use, um, let's use Activision, for example, for Call of Duty League. So if they were putting in and they said, this is how we're going to handle Call of Duty League, period. The game changes inside the scope, but none of, nothing around it, how it's regulated, how they have, is that what you mean? I, th 
I think that would be one of the factors. I, I think we would look to you, this committee now, to help us formulate that and put it in writing that, that, that that's what we would allow. I think we're looking for that kind of advice and leadership from this group. I don't know if any of us have the uh, expertise and the knowledge to, to know that right now. Thank you. Any other questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Morton, please read in agenda item five. Agenda item number five is a presentation by Sam McMullen on data collection and privacy issues in competitive esports. Welcome. Do we have him? Okay. There he is. Welcome. Please state your name for the record. I think you're on mute. No, oh, I apologize. I didn't. No. There we go. No apology necessary. I do the same thing. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's the it's the, the sign of the times, you know, during the pandemic and learning all these different video systems. And um, you'd think that I work with technology every day that I would be I would be more apt to. But thank you very much for your patience. Um, my name is Samuel P. McMullen the fifth. Um, I am a fifth generation Nevadan. I am a long time. Uh, I've been I've worked with some of the um, esteemed members of this committee. Uh, I wanted to thank you guys for for inv inviting me to be here today. Um, we are going to be talking about something a little bit different than I normally do, but I hope that it meets with your approval. And then there's been a, a, my colleagues and others that have spoken, plus your questions have actually touched on several things that I've done and worked on. Um, and I know that some of the members of the committee are are aware of this. Uh, I would be happy to go into more detail with those, but I didn't prepare those for today. So. Uh, without further ado, I wanted to talk about uh, opportunities, not so much the, the threats. I like to be forward thinking and I'm a futurist at heart. And I said, I was a, I'm a fifth generation Nevadan. So you'll notice that five gen, my company is, uh, that's why it's named such. Uh, let me find a way to present. And, uh, I think I can go full screen and still see it. Can you still see that? Yes. You can? All right, excellent. Um, all right, so I, I'm here to talk to you today about opportunities in esports data, um, also some of the privacy issues and some of the, some of the things that um, might affect our industry, uh, especially as this committee gets started. Um, we all know that esports is growing faster than ever uh, between, um, between uh, 2020 and 2021, we had a 14.5% increase in uh, in the amount of of um, participants and players and people that were interested in in betting on it. So, um, so the, and this is just only going to increase. We all saw that with during the pandemic, and I believe it was reported by the UK Gaming UK Gaming um, Commission that there was, um, they had a, an increase of, uh, what they said was 2,992% over year over year increase between uh, uh, July, over July of 2020, up till July of 2020. Um, because of the pandemic, there was no slowdown. Where other, where other sports markets were, fa were, were flagging, uh, the, um, the pandemic did not slow down esports, the interest in esports betting. All right, as Ian, as Ian spoke earlier about, uh, he was talking about the, I'm sorry here, I gotta bring my presenter notes in front of me. Please forgive me. 
All right. Um, huh, we, he was talking about how there are four different categories and he shared this with me ahead of, ahead of time. And I thought I, I'd give it a little bit more um, attention here. Uh, but the increase, the increases in, in the anticipated handle, you know, is, is going to obviously lure, lure in people that are going to want to take advantage of the, you know, in, increase in, in, in money and in um, maybe prestige and other things like that. Some people hack, hack things or do things, not, to, not for the money, but sometimes for the bragging rights. Uh, so when he told me that 92% of bat match fixing is driven by betting fraud, uh, you know, that was, that gave me some cause for concern. And that's something that this, this subcommittee can actually, uh, I think really attack by, I think this is, it warrants bringing up the fact that I've always wanted to see Nevada have the opportunity to build a world-class esports environment of competitive gaming because of consistency with the heritage of a scandal free gaming industry. Currently there are no form, no formalized standards or provable technological processes for inventing fraud um, in specifically esports, so that betting on the on the outcome of an esports tournament competition is fair and balanced. Uh, I know that there are in other parts of Nevada gaming, but esports is still the wild west, as Ian said. Nevada can really be the first here to market to implement a strong set of standards that promotes a fair and equitable experience for both the amateur and professional video game video gaming activities where betting is allowed. According to games, games industry biz, global esports revenues are expected. They were they were expected to reach nine nine hundred five point six million in twenty eighteen. We 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 definitely exceeded that, and now and then one point six five billion by twenty twenty one. Now that's anticipated to be one point eight billion by twenty twenty two. So we are um, we're definitely seeing this this growing, uh, with millions of players ready to descend on cities throughout the state for the opportunity to test their skills against the best players, a set of esports standards and technical solutions that pr protect the interests of Nevada gaming and gaming licensees, along with tournament organizers, game publishers, and other industry partners provides necessary measures for a scandal-free industry to continue for years to come. Nevada is in a perfect position to become the leader of the esports competitive gaming um, international hub by allowing sports wagering for the following reasons. Um, Nevada Gaming needs to do this for future revenue replacement. We've locked we've, we've locked some money from the pandemic. I don't I don't know as much about um, about you know specific specific, but most people have been feeling that. Um, and so, as a result, we um, we also have an opportunity because we have a gold standard um, as a fifth generation Nevadan. As my father had been involved in gaming for many many years. Um, and as a gaming lobbyist, I, I've been I've been privy to and happy to learn from him that there's we've just we've been always been scandal free. We've been ahead of the curve, and I think we can do that again. But that that means that we need to take advantage of technological solutions and technological standards. And I think we can I think that we can do that. Let me get to the next one here. Okay, one of the things that I believe, uh, was it you, Mr. Chairman, that was talking about um, um, identifying the player being the most important thing to you, correct? It was Mr. Smith, oh, oh. Paul Hamilton, for the record, apologies. Apologies, uh, I apologize for making it interactive. No, uh, no problem. But, um, well, no, I, I, so yes, I, um, I also agree with this. And when I was talking with Ian earlier in the last couple of weeks, uh, he said that identifying a player beyond their username or email is very hard when they aren't when they aren't known. Um, when you increase, as he said, when you increase the the appetite um, within it, with that kind of increase, there also is a pressure for operators to start offering more and more odds or more and more opening more and more markets um, with pl players and and leagues and teams that are unknown. And so. When they aren't known and they do something bad, they cheat or they match fix or they dope or whatever they're doing uh, to, you know, to somehow uh, interfere with the game and, you know, and to garner themselves some financial gain, I guess, uh, they, um, it becomes a very critical factor and they become the slot machines, uh, as my dad once said, uh, they became, they become the slot machines. So uh, one of the things that I wanted, what, what, one of the things that 
that inf- impacts this, and I need to, I'm not an attorney, but I have many in my family, and they've said quite a bit about these things. I read also on the American Bar Association that after post, post-PASPA, post-Murphy, uh, and uh, other things that have caused such this surge in growth, uh, there's no, no I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised when I found this, that there is no single comprehensive federal data protection law uh, there are several federal laws that address different pieces of data security in specific areas, including the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, DCPA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, CFAA, Consumer Financial Protection Act, CFPA, the Health and Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, which we all know and we probably have uh, encountered, um, Fair Credit Reporting Act, FCRA, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, Children Online Privacy Protection Act COPPA, um, and the FTC, of course, the FTC Act. What, I, what, we, what I'm finding is that there are, the existing laws represent a very highly diverse and very spread out forms of data and the different expectations of privacy with, the, with all of those. They're, they're, the requirements for each one of them are very, very divergent. Um, and not, there's not a unified sense of, uh, of, a, of something that would be I think an opportunity for us in Nevada to create legislation that would be more comprehensive around data privacy and data protection, uh, because it, it matters to not just the user, uh, but it matters also to the operator uh, and those that that are the largest drivers of our economy here. So data drives decisions and decisions drive data. One of the things that I, I truly, I believe is that our um, people are the ones that um, we, cre- we create decisions. Those decisions in play, especially in esports, are what drive the data that is created. Uh, and then that data in turn comes around and drives, dis- drives more decisions. And so I think having a, a, a framework for it you know, included in the standards is something that would be would take these these pillars here, like I, I'm saying that we need to have at the top, credible, trusted, known esports players, leagues, teams, fans, and users. So to this end, back in 2015, 2016, 2017, um, my firm, 5Gen, we, we were talking with some friends that were gaming publishers, and they told us that they were in the game making business, not the password making business or the authentication making business. And they really wanted to be able to identify individual players and then be able to track them through through their through their game um, by being able to literally see exactly what they're doing and so we we went away for about a year and then we came back uh, I think it was um, at the spring finals actually at the Mandalay Bay Lavelle I know that you were at MGM at one point so I think I was actually there at that time or you were there at that time I uh, um we created a thing called TitanAuth.com, and TitanAuth is a mobile application that um, identifies, registers, um, and then ties that person's real-world identity to their digital identities. We then hash that information and discard it, so we don't actually need to keep any personal identifying information. We 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 assign it to an activity ledger or meta ledger, and that's you know something that's on the blockchain, which allows a hybridization between the traditional data, uh, you know, centralized servers and centralized systems that are already in existence today and uh, decentralized systems um, and future systems. So we're future proofing something that um, allows us to, you know, distribute the ledger. So we will net then there's no single point of failure. Um, And so next we go into the publisher partner network and official data provider and official data is very important here because when you get data from third parties that are uh, like OCR or screen, um, or even antiquated, we have other in tournaments. We've seen people. I've seen people write on paper, like who won, and then there's disputes typically <laughs> over some of those. So when I when I learned uh, recently, actually, I, I surprised I didn't know about as much or I'd heard about them before, but I hadn't really looked into them. Um, was Grid.gg, and um, I know that. Uh, uh, um, Mr. Hannigan, your, your, your company just signed a deal with them, I, I, I believe. So I, I think they're in, tr- incredible. And the fact that they're doing an open data network is just an, an, an incredible, uh, incredible thing. And I think that's going to be really good at driving innovation. So I think also, and then that 
you know, ties it, those, those two then funneling together, I think that having a, an authenticator that's on a meta ledger that works with both, both traditional and, and new systems um, that I continuously uses biometric um, authentication and then pattern recognition to authenticate a person and fingerprint them, a player DNA, if you will, uh, that pushes into publish, the publisher partner network and official data provider grid, which is working with not just the tournament organizers and providers and operators and um, books and, uh, and I mean, pretty much everybody, it looks like right now. Uh, and I think they're going to continue to grow. They, they, be, they serve a really important need. The, first of all, they're esports focused, they're video game focused, uh, they're community focused, and they're driving that, that feedback loop. So they're going to create th what they create, creates stuff and returns, and then, you know, creates data, creates decisions, creates data. Uh, so that's incredible. And um, I really want to see more and more of them, and I want to learn more about them. And I hope that this, this body ends up working with them. I think that it'd be incredible. That would then pass into the threat alert network. And that's where a the continuously involving mechanism that allows instant fraud and corruption detection and prosecution. Uh, what I say instant is because it may not be instant, it may not be instant now, but it, I think it will become that with these, these things where technology stacks on top of human interaction and becomes something that makes it even easier for us to spot potential threats, um, fraud, match fixing, et cetera. Uh, and then I think that passes, of course, into the benefit of sportsbook and casino operators and anyone else who operates a brick and mortar or online um, gaming establishment. Uh, you know, these are licensees. These are people that are very important to our economy. And I think, and the economy, you know, around the world, I think, but I think Nevada is really, really the, we're, we, we, are have, we have this gold standard and I think we should be innovating in order to maintain it. And then they can go out and teach everybody else. Um, and then, of course, Mr. Bishop, you're you're also here. Um, that that I think then this this benefits broadcasters and organizers. I would love to see and be really interested to talk to you guys about how you see this, um, how you see this this evolving. You know, if we use technology and stack it into that kind of thing. I know that I've spoken to some other folks at Twitch, and they've said that they were very interested in being able to identify streamers. And not just for the fraud or potential, you know, hacking or smurfing of an account, but also because these people work really hard to create their stream um, channels over a long period of time. And one hacker can take out their, their entire thing. Um, and that's where I think usernames and passwords are just completely <laughs> obsolete. Multi-factor is even obsolete. Two factors, you know, obsolete. And I, I see that that is continuously being used, uh, but we, we can upgrade it. We have, we have the technology. We can build something better. It doesn't cost $6 million either. Uh, I think then we, then we pass that into um, regulators and lawmakers. This allows, you know, creates, create, creating new, unique and new legislation and laws quickly, um, probably even faster than we could before, because I think we can, we can rapidly iterate. Um, that, that would allow the above industry providers to legally and ethically, you know, be able to share information then um, without violating privacy and data protection or cybersecurity laws. I think that's something that's key is collaboration is gonna be key in this. And then it gets to um, education, innovation, um, and the next generation. I instantaneous distributed, intelligent, safe, cheap, and very secure applications. Uh, Cog, like using things like cognitive and empathic smart AIs. I don't know if you, I don't know if anybody plays Halo here, but Cortana in the game is actually closer to reality than we think. There are certain ones that are empath. There are AIs in, in the world right now that are empathic and cognitive, not self-aware, but could be very helpful in that, in that kind of context. Um, we can then, they, they then can employ worker bots and machine learning, um, you know, and various other assisted systems to read and write data via new Web3 distributed and decentralized ledgers, providing unparalleled speed and data integrity, while also reducing potential for a single fraudulent action to corrupt the network, or, you know, otherwise just, you know, um, or the database or the blockchain, any one of those single, any, any one of those single, single um, points of failure would be, would be, um, 
enhanced by use of the blockchain. I also think that uh, Dr. Barbonell, you talked earlier about skins. Um, I think NFTs will be the new skin. I think that because there's a there's distinct ownership in there, um, and the fact that you'll have an authenticator that will actually be able to identify who owns what, when, where they got the prize, how they got the prize, and just think about what that could do for regulation. Uh, there's, you know, this these are there's a lot of crypto concern currency supported transaction platforms uh, out there. And I think I think they'd be very good partners here too. Um, then there's now the, 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 the new web, as people are calling it, which is not as new to me, but uh, one of my favorite authors, Neil Stevenson in 1992, wrote a book called Snow Crash, where he, he, he coined the phrase metaverse. Um, ever since then, not only, have I, not only have, have I been fascinated with it, but it seems like a lot of other people have. And now we have a metaverse, which is a real-time VR, very realistic uh, version of the internet. Uh, so we're now gonna be visiting uh, these digital worlds and we're gonna be wearing goggles to do it. And eventually we're gonna have augmented reality glasses like the upcoming Apple Glass and many others where this will be overlaid on top of the real world. And so the, the ability to enhance experiences inside of integrated resorts, inside of casinos, and possibly uh, elsewhere is, is very real and very, uh, will be very compelling, I think. So this brings me to questions or comments. I'm sorry I went through that very quickly, but I tend to talk fast and I apologize if I did so, but it's been a while since I've spoken in front of a body and other than my, my own team, uh, and I uh, hope I did okay for you guys. Seth Shore, for the record, you did great, Sam. Thank, thank you. You know, I, I want to uh, uh, thank you for being such an advocate uh, for esports for many, many years. Uh, and I am certain in the future we'll be talking to you uh, in the metaverse, uh, in the virtual version of this room. So, you know, thank you for putting this all together. Yeah, I hope so. That would be very cool, actually. And thank you very much for giving me one of uh, the opportunity to work with you. I really was pleased and happy to, and I'm sorry I didn't mention it here, but I'm mentioning it now that uh, Mr. Shore was was nice enough to bring me on and help and have me help him to uh, bring esports to the casino floor. And I was it's really neat to be able to say that I was part of that. So thank you again. I really appreciate it. Any other questions, anyone? Did I go too fast? <clears throat> I loved your speed, Paul Hamilton, for the record. If no one else has any questions, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, we appreciate the presentation. It was uh, very educational. Well, good. I was going to mention one more thing. We wrote 5,000, I think, plus um, suggestions of a framework for standards um, for the minimum internal controls. Uh, this was Quite a wise, quite a wise ways back, but if it benefits you guys and as to as as you're starting up and creating your body and then potentially evolves into something that creates a state, federal, or national esports commission, I would be very much happy to contribute those to you guys uh, to the this sorry to this committee and um, and the board at large so that we can actually lead we can lead the world in esports. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, everyone. I very much appreciate it. Uh, I will. Um, do I need to sign off or what do I do? <laughs> this is our first rodeo, too. Yeah. The committee will now take a five minute recess. Thank you. Okay.
Hello. Paul Hamilton for the record. Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, March 1st. We will now reconvene the first meeting of Nevada Gaming Control Board's Esports Technical Advisory Committee. Mr. Morris, Mr. Morton, please read in agenda item number six. Agenda item number six is a presentation by the Esports Entertainment Group relating to recent developments in New Jersey relating to legal wagering on esports. Thank you. Hi everyone. Can you uh, can you all hear me? Okay. We can. Welcome. Right. Please state your name for the Great. record. Uh, for the record, this is Jeff Cohen, uh, Chairman Hamilton, all the members of the committee. I'd like to start by thanking you for giving me the opportunity to speak today on behalf of Esports Entertainment Group. Um, I don't have any slides, so unfortunately, you guys will just have to uh, look at my face. Um, before I give you some background on myself and our company, I'd like to commend the Nevada Gaming Control Board for putting together this advisory committee and recognizing esports and gaming as a major potential growth area for gambling in your state. Simply by taking this initiative, you, you're already ahead of the vast majority of state regulators in addressing this area. I already know some of you on this committee, uh, but for those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm the Vice President of Strategy here at Esports Entertainment Group. Prior to EEG, I was an equity research analyst covering public gaming, esports, and online gambling companies at an investment bank assembly company. We operate across two segments, games and iGaming. Our game segment is made up of the following products and brands that I'll run through uh, quickly. Esports Gaming League, which is our B2B tournament organizer that offers technology and support services for third parties looking to host online and in-person gaming events. GG Circuit, which is a B2B software and services provider to land centers, casinos, movie theaters, and family entertainment venues who are looking to use gaming and esports to further engage their customer bases. And finally, Landuel, which is our peer-to-peer -peer competition and wagering platform that will debut at, in March at the Hard Rock in Atlantic City. It allows skill-based wagering across our network of esports events uh, by facilitating matchmaking and managing prize money. Turning to our iGaming segment, uh, which is really the core of what I'm here today to discuss, we're focused on leveraging our five tier one gambling licenses to deliver casino, sportsbook, and esports gambling solutions to tens of thousands of customers globally. While EEG iGaming currently generates the majority of our revenue from Europe, uh, in January, our ViGG brand was granted a transactional waiver um, in the state of New Jersey to begin accepting bets as the first esports focused sports book in that state. Michael Morton and the task force uh, invited us here today to discuss some of our early takeaways and learnings from this re recent launch. However, before I jump into that, I wanted to address a few very common misconceptions about the esports industry that often come up when I speak with legislators and regulators. None of this will probably come as a surprise to the industry professionals on the advisory committee, but I do think it's worth noting for the public record. First, um, we often hear concerns that gaming and gambling shouldn't be mixed because of the young age of gamers. In fact, just a few weeks ago, the American Gaming Association's Bill Miller said when asked about esports, this is not an area that's been opened up. The people who are primarily playing esports are underage and betting on them creates a whole host of issues. While we certainly respect Mr. Miller's perspective and his leadership of the AGA, when you actually evaluate the data, this really turns out not to be the case. According to the Entertainment Software Association, the average age of a gamer in the United States is 35 years old, and over 80% of gamers are over the age of 18. While it is true that professional esports teams will often have players under the age of 21, we do not see the distinction as to why esports would be dangerous, whereas betting on March Madness or college football where almost all of the participants are underage, does not receive the same scrutiny. Additionally, while it is also true that the average age of an esports better skews about a decade younger than that of a traditional sports better, our belief is that this makes it actually even more important to legalize and regulate the product. Plenty of esports betting, uh, like Ian talked about earlier, is already taking place. It's just being done on offshore sites that don't have the proper controls in place. Once legalized and brought into the light of day, we can ensure that no underage gamblers are able to access our software utilizing tools such as ID Comply and other safety measures. This will ensure a safer ecosystem for all involved. The second concern that we commonly hear about space um, is around cheating and match fixing, with the perception being that this is something that is rampant. While it is true that there have been instances of impropriety in esports, and Ian um, spoke to many of those earlier, 
it's really only ever been in very low quality leagues that lack the proper integrity frameworks and oversight in the first place. To be clear, as a licensed operator in tier one jurisdictions, it would never be our intention to take bets on events of this low of a level. The leagues that we take bets on are significantly more mature in terms of integrity protocols, often usually working with Ian's organization, the Esports Integrity Commission, as well as partnering with integrity managing monitoring platforms such as Sport Radar or Genius to ensure compliance. The process by which wagerable, wagerable events are approved by regulators is a very important issue to us and one that I will discuss further uh, in just a minute. Overall, we do not believe there's any greater level of integrity risk inherent in esports than there are in more accepted sports such as tennis, rugby, or even soccer, all of which have had their fair share of controversy at, at various different levels of leagues. Additionally, as esports leagues have become more professionalized and player salaries and prestige have increased, we believe the incentives to throw matches has dramatically decreased, um, as I think Chairman Hamilton alluded to earlier. Pivoting now to discuss our recent launch in New Jersey, um, as it's still early days and we're actually still in the regulatory soft launch window, plus the fact that we're a publicly traded company, I'm not gonna discuss um, any numbers or stats around the launch. Um, I like to focus more broadly on a few areas that we think can be improved upon by other states that are looking to foster a healthy environment for esports betting. Before I do that, I'd like to start by saying the state of New Jersey um, has been a phenomenal partner to us, and they've really been committed to bringing esports and gaming um, to their state in a big way, all the way from, from Governor Murphy's office on down. In particular, we would like to thank Afshin Lashkari, the head of the DG Testing Lab, and Michael Galoub, the Deputy Attorney General overseeing esports betting, for their efforts um, in helping us get launched. Now, a really important logistical element that we believe could be ironed out better as was talked about before, is the process of getting events approved to be wagered on. Currently, the process in New Jersey, as I now know is the case here in Nevada as well, is manual, slow, and cumbersome for both operators as well as regulators. Each event and bet type must be signed off on and approved on a case-by-case -case basis. This really creates a poor user experience for players as there could be not enough options to bet on. And, um, sorry. And events or, or events events must be approved without lead time to properly market to attract uh, to attract customers. The reason the process is this way is largely due to the nature of esports, which are really disparate different games and leagues rather than one monolithic entity like the NFL. Additionally, regulators have struggled with the fact that there is no one governing body for esports. Because of this, we have long been a proponent of creating an approved whitelist of leagues that are eligible to be wagered on based on certain criteria and using the Esports Integrity Commission as the governing body to ensure compliance. The criteria to be eligible for this whitelist is undoubtedly something the Technical Advisory Committee will spend plenty of time ironing out, but the need for this list, I think, is pretty evident. When, when the appropriate time comes, EEG is happy to share our input on some of the things that we believe should be included. Um, additionally, we believe uh, cooperation and communication between different gambling commissions may help ease some of the burden of diligencing various leagues and events and eliminate duplicative investigations across jurisdictions. The esports wagering ecosystem is still very nascent and most gambling regulators do not have on staff people who are experts in this area or even advisory committees like the one um, convened here today. Sharing of knowledge across the ecosystem would greatly benefit all involved. In addition to a whitelist, another approach we've seen work in places like the UK and jurisdictions like Malta is for regulators to approve certain game titles like Call of Duty, for example, and then treat it no differently than betting on any other live event. The risks associated with esports events is then mitigated by event organizers, licensed online operators, and their licensed um, odds data providers. This puts the onus on the organizations to do the necessary due diligence and determine whether a league is safe to provide odds on for their customers. This approach has the advantage of being a bit more hands-off for the regulators um, than the whitelist option. The second important element we would like to discuss here is expanded support for prop bets and in-play betting. Currently, New Jersey does not allow props or in-play betting on esports events. This is unfortunate because just as we've seen in traditional sports, in-play betting is growing significantly as a percentage of total handle uh, in esports. In our view, so long as odds providers have sufficient access to live data feeds such that they're able to accurately and safely provide in-play lines, then we would like to be able to offer those odds to our customers. Additionally, um, we believe props or bets where customers are wagering on an event taking place in the game 
that is not the overall outcome of the match are a very engaging and fun product to offer to our customers. Most traditional sports books have a robust prop betting market, and we really see no reason for esports to be treated any differently in this regard. Finally, um, one last thing we would offer as a potential suggestion to this committee is to evaluate whether a separate licensing and market access regime may be the best way to foster innovation in this area. No state um, has taken leadership yet here yet and gone down this path, but we see it as an important step. Um, as the market access burden for esports only operators is economically difficult. And currently we've seen very little investment from larger sportsbook operators in product and marketing to grow this vertical. Um, I think that's, we saw that in the data that was shown earlier where there hasn't been any, no operator in, in Nevada has um, asked for a, a bet in 2021. I find that shocking. Um, so having a dedicated esports license, not subject to broader sportsbook market access, and, higher license, and high licensing fees would allow for more esports focused operators such as Esports Entertainment Group and others to enter the space and invest to grow this market. To close, um, I'd like to once again thank Chairman Hamilton, as well as the whole Esports Technical um, Advisory Committee and the Nevada Gaming Control Board for allowing me the platform today to share um, some of our experiences at EEG. With that, um, answer any questions. Seth Shore for the record. Uh, thank you for that. That was very helpful. Uh, very exciting uh, to see what you're doing in New Jersey. I know that it's been a very long work in progress. So uh, kudos. Um, you touched a lot on the esports betting uh, and the regulations that you are dealing with in New Jersey. Can you talk a little bit about LandDuel and the peer to peer platform you've created? Yeah, so as Seth meant, thank you, Seth, first of all, it, it was a, a long process. Hopefully our next dates will be slightly less arduous now that we have the blueprint down. So for those of you who are not familiar, LandDuel is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, wagering product. And currently right now it operates under the skill betting exemption. So I, I'm not familiar specifically with N Nevada's rules around that, um, but I believe there's 41 or so states that we can operate that product under and, it, and it's not considered to be a gambling product. Basically what that does is enable, you know, Seth and I could be playing a game of Madden and, and wager five bucks, 10 bucks, you know, 20 bucks. And um, the winner takes the pot, the house takes a rake. And, you know, we're starting to do that initially in Atlantic City at the Hard Rock, we'll have our first event. Um, and then we're looking to roll that out into, into various casinos. We think it's a really exciting product for casinos that are, kind of starved for a younger demographic and, and looking for new ways to engage customers. So we're excited about it. Did that answer the question, Seth? It did, thank you. Paul Hamilton for the record. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Jeff. Uh, one question on land duel, is that, what it, is that what it was called? Yeah, it stems from uh, land center, like L-A-N duel. A oh, land duel. Okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, I'm aware. Okay, so is this a product that you're offering online? Because there are obviously there are a whole bunch of platforms like Skills out there, etc. Or is this specifically yours, made to go into a casino where people, you know, you draw traffic in and they play there, or is it both? Currently, it's 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 physical in person to kind of draw people into casinos. So we worked with the New Jersey DG and their testing lab to kind of ensure that it was a product. Uh, I believe we had to get a casino supplier's license to ensure that we could you could use it in a regulated environment. Eventually, our goal was to roll it out to land centers through our GG Circuit um, operating system software, and then eventually into players' houses. Um, although there there is a a whole host of things that need to come with that. Um, there are platforms doing that currently. Our belief is that some of them are operating a bit in the gray market and um, we like to be the white hat and kind of make sure that everything is buttoned up from a regulatory perspective and um, a safety perspective and compliance perspective, first and foremost. Agreed. Anybody else have questions? Brett okay. Barbanel for the record. Um, as a point of clarification, perhaps from Mr. Morton, as this is listed in the agenda as discussion moment, is that is all right to bring up a discussion point versus a direct question to Mr. Cohen? 
you, you may discuss anything within the scope of the agenda items as long as you don't move toward um, taking action or deliberating towards taking action. I can follow that guideline, thank you. <laughs> uh, first, thank you, Mr. Cohen. This was uh, an excellent presentation. As somebody who uh, spends a lot of time in academe and PowerPoints, it was very refreshing to look at your face for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, I, you bring up a very good point with land dual and skill-based wagering, particularly when it comes to wagering on outcomes of competitions in which these individuals are coming together and not necessarily in a professionalized setting. And so my point of discussion perhaps for a future meeting would be uh, for it potentially to be beneficial for this committee to discuss I, hopefully not too philosophically here, what esports is for purposes of wagering in the state of Nevada, in that uh, perhaps something like what uh, Mr. Cohen has described, as, as, as you've mentioned, fits within skill-based wagering, and where we might be talking about wagering on professional esports events. And I don't know if that's something that might fall to a committee like this one, uh, but it's something that, that came to my mind as you were presenting, so thank you. Thank you. I mean, I don't know if it's my turn to respond to that, but we would love to come back and, and discuss that at any point with the committee. Paul Hamilton, for the record. Oh, go, oh, ahead, go ahead, Lovell. Uh, there's two, I'm two for two on this now. <laughs> Lavelle Walker, for the record. Uh, Jeff, thanks for that presentation. Uh, quick question about some of the nuances that you see when it comes to being an operator that's esports only. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, a pivot from your last question, or at least an expansion from your from your last comment of, about having a license that has less scrutiny around um, just being accepted, whether it's tax rate or whether it's the entry price. What what do you see that uh, a bet a bet MGM, uh, a barstool sports, a, a DK, or a FanDuel can't offer an, an esports that that you're able to to that audience? So to be fair, it's certainly nothing that that the bigger operators can't offer. I think it's more of a focus and attention thing. Um, there are nuances to the product where I think some there are some things that can be tailored to esports betters versus traditional sports betters that it's probably not necessarily worth getting into. But it's it's more about the the focus on marketing towards to these customers. I think when we've seen bigger operators incorporate esports betting, it's a lot more as an add on and kind of like an upsell. So it's someone who's betting every day on the NFL. And then there happens to be the Madden Bowl Championship, and they'll just kind of throw that line up there and try to get their traditional sports bettors to bet on that. They're not necessarily, mar to my understanding, they're not necessarily marketing towards and, and trying to attract kind of the esports first bettors. Um, and I think that's something that if you had a, an esports dedicated sports book, they would be targeting and bringing those people into the gambling ecosystem, um, which then obviously would be good for the state growing tax revenue because. I don't believe that those bettors are currently betting on the likes of DraftKings, BetMGM, you know, Penn or Barstool Sports. They're probably doing it on an illegal website currently. Thanks. Paul Hamilton for the record. Jeff, can you explain to me how it, on the on LAN is it required two players? I assume is how do you skill base rank? Or you just feels a little bit like, you know, when I was growing up and I played pool and I was trying to figure out if if I was going to be better than the person I was playing or not. So is it is it a function of like you're going in there with your buddies to play or is it a function of you're standing by it waiting for somebody to come up and, and you're going to bet them or I'm just, I guess yeah. I'm just trying to understand. And then how do you guys, is there something that regulates rank and speed inside of the game for the two players that are playing? For the moment, it, it, it's currently the latter. I mean, we do have software and matchmaking in place, but as you can appreciate with um, physical locations, um, player liquidity is already, even for an online platform like Xbox, sometimes I'll go to play Madden and it'll take me three or four minutes to get a game. So we're going to probably not do a ton of skill-based matchmaking in person just because you wouldn't have the player liquidity probably to do that. When, when we have bigger events or there is a lot of people in, in one place, that is a lot more possible. Um, you know, and right now it's, it has to be 1v1 or, or well, 1v1 eventually teams. We don't have currently like a you can bet against yourself, which I know a lot of some other operators have tried to launch. Um, to me, that's a little bit of a tougher, tougher problem. 
Thank you. All right, Jeff, I'm looking around and it doesn't look like anyone else is putting their hand up. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank, thank you all for having me. Mr. Morton, this brings us to our last agenda item, public comment. This item is placed on the agenda to give the public an opportunity to comment on matters related to esports and gaming. Anyone wishing to make a public comment, please step forward to the podium. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to offer public comment? Is there anyone in Las Vegas wishing to offer public comment? Please state your name for the record. Uh, hi, Chair Her Hamilton uh, Committee. Uh, my name is Eric Bowers. I'm VP of Innovation for Boy Gaming. Welcome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first, I'd just like to say um, it is fantastic that this committee is getting <clears throat> has gotten together. Um, and when I look at the composite of, of members, um, it really fits into our strategy as we try and be um, a leader in this space, uh, particularly in partnership with with you folks in, in Nevada here. Um, <clears throat> boy, it, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for those of you who don't know, Boyd Gaming is a we're about four and a half billion dollar um, gaming company, uh, 10 jurisdictions. Um, we, we have obviously a substantial land-based product. Um, and the, for those of you who don't know, we're, we're also building a, a pretty robust online product suite as well. Um, right now focused on iGaming, race and sports and social gaming. And um, we look at eSports. It's interesting, a lot of these comments that were made, we look at eSports as a um, an opportunity twofold. One is to grow revenue, um, just siloed based on its own, own product itself, and also as a as a feeder um, for demographics that we haven't touched on yet, a feeder into our core online product uh, suite, which of course, like I said, is iGaming, race and sports, and and social gaming. We too don't believe that they're necessarily all all these um, um, esports potential wagers are, are also just transition or convert right to race and sports wagers um, in the traditional sense. We, we believe that sometimes they may, they may actually convert into iGamers, social gamers. We believe that that demographic is just a little bit different. And e even in, in the intent to, to launch eSports, we are not necessarily going to target, though it will fall from a, our compliance perspective, fall under our race and sports world. Um, from a wagering and regulation perspective, from branding and a marketing perspective, it may not fall in line with, hey, it's just another channel of, of sports wagering, because we feel that it gets lost in, <coughs> excuse me, in that, in that system. So just to kind of set the, set, set, um, set the record straight there. Um, again, looking at the composite of the group, um, it, it is terrific. Uh, we, you know, we have a, a, a pretty substantial investment in Blackfire at UNLV, and we look to pilot um, some of our esports online wagering um, initiatives at that <laughs> facility, um, just uh, as as kind of a local test facility. So, and and UNLV has been there's been a lot of excitement in that or in in the, in the university and the students um, for participating in capstone projects along those lines. Um, and then, of course, uh, when we look to launch, um, and, and again, this is something that we're serious about. This is something that we have um, intention to actually come back to this committee in the near term with a uh, technology stack proposal in line with some technology partners that we're working with, including Grid, um, for, a, for an overall uh, technology-based solution evaluation um, that meets the criteria of, of, of what you are going to build from a policy perspective. So just want to, and, and, and part of that is I'd like to, um, I think uh, the last presenter, I think he, he, had, he had mentioned the importance of in-play wagering. So there's some things that we intend and we hope to, to, to help foster and, and promote with this um, committee, um, particularly in-play wagering. Uh, is very would be very important and critical to our launch. Matter of fact, I think it would be um, 
it, it would be a, a deal breaker if we didn't have that because it, it um, we look at that as as a, even a, a more primary building block than 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 match based uh, wagering um, in our in our launch and also so so we're looking at the technologies that support that um, and in in the technology companies and partners and vendor uh, vendors and partners that that will support that um, another area that we're looking to um, to in, intend to launch with is para, a paramutual framework. And that paramutual framework will, will be based on um, prop, prop level uh, wagering uh, for the most part. Um, so, that, so that in play wagering, again, that component becomes even, even more, more critical as well. So those two areas are, are, are big focuses for us. Um, the other thing that very cognizant of, of what we talked about from a, um, a, a you know, only, at least what we launched with only using um, sanctioned, um, you know, uh, uh, publisher approved events. Um, and, and, and we prefer actually a whitelist type of approach as well, just from a standpoint, from an operational standpoint, at least, even if it's an annual whitelist that we start with, um, you know, that, that would be easier from an operator perspective because just from a, from a process um, and, and, and launch of each event and being able to, to offer more of a, not so much 24 by seven wagering opportunities, but, but at least in, in the pilot or the field trial, it would be, you know, we'd be able to, 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 to plan our events accordingly. And then finally, um, one of the big things we're focused on with GRID is, um, in particular, is the fact that um, we would launch with uh, what we would, we would term as official server data versus you know the OCR, the tra traditional scraped uh, data, and so giving giving you as a committee confidence from an operator perspective that we would only launch, particularly in play wagering, we would only allow that on official server data um, that would come from the APIs that you know the publishers would approve and that kind of thing. So, um, just wanted to lay all that out um, that we're in a lot of alignment with what was discussed today, and just wanted to support some of the some of the points that were brought up. That makes sense, right? Seth, sure, for the record. Uh, Eric, thank you so much. Um, what a great way to end this meeting, the support from such an important uh, Nevada licensee like Big Gaming. Uh, I think if there's any naysayers out there that still think uh, that the sportsbook operators don't want esports betting, you've put that to rest. Um, so I wanna thank you for doing that. Um, I have had the opportunity over the years to work with a number of casino operators who had an interest in esports, and that interest um, uh, allowed them to dip their toe in the water. And I think uh, they didn't see the results uh, that they were looking for for a number of reasons. Um, but the way that you and Boyd have approached this with a full strategy in mind is, is, is very much commendable. Um, and I love the fact uh, that you said it'd be a deal breaker to not have uh, in, in, in play wagering. You know, I love that. I want to hear, we want to hear from the operators, um, you know, what they need to make this successful and what you believe your customers want. Otherwise, what's the point in, in doing this? Um, so I, I just couldn't can't thank you enough uh, for take, taking the time to come up here and, and sharing. Absolutely. And and just to add to that, uh, a lot of, lot of um, what operators have traditionally looked at from esports was kind of the physical venues and and that's that's a little bit more challenging for us to us to, to sell to our senior leadership talk to our senior leadership because physical space takes up slot space or takes up takes up games of chance that are our our speed to return right and and esports is a, was a little bit more harder to digest but focusing on the online engagement that we have now and the opportunity that we have now i think i think it's terrific and again uh anything that we can do to help um, evangelize in, in partnership with this committee. Um, we'd love to love to be a part of that. Thank you, Eric. I concur with with Seth. Um, really, really glad you came out. All right. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Is there anyone else in Las Vegas wishing to offer public comment? I'd like to thank those that presented to our committee today, as well as staff and board members. This concludes the first meeting of the Nevada Gaming Control Board's Esports Technical Advisory Committee. We are adjourned.